professor in bioengineering and a professor of chemical and biological engineering and molecular biology at Princeton. She earned her uh, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and biology at MIT in 98, PhD in biomedical engineering from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in 2003, and had a postdoctoral training in life sciences at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory until 2007. Her group specializes in using engineered tissues and computational models to understand how mechanical forces direct developmental patterning events during tissue morphogenesis and during disease progression with a particular emphasis on the vertebrate lung. She has more than 150 peer reviewed papers. Her contributions are, uh, her contributions to the fields of tissue, tissue mechanics and morphogenesis have been recognized by numerous awards, including a Burrow, Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Award at the Scientific uh, Interface, the Packard Fellowship, Sloan Fellowship, MIT TR35, Ellen Colburn Award, Tafers Teacher Scholar Award, Faculty Scholar Award from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and a Mid-Career Award from the Biomedical Engineering Society. The floor is yours, uh, Celeste. Oh, well, thank you so very much, um, both for the invitation as well as the introduction. I am thrilled uh, to be participating in this uh, in this series. It's it's been really fantastic um, to see the the different talks so far. Um, today, I want to spend some time sharing um, the, the work that my group has been um, focused on, um, specifically on the lung, um, which is uh, my favorite organ. Um, and as a developmental bioengineer, uh, the lung is my favorite organ for a number of different reasons. Um, one of those is that the lung represents one of these engineering unit operations uh, that we teach our undergraduate students, specifically that of mass or gas exchange. Um, and another reason uh, that the lung is my favorite organ is because its function is intimately coupled uh, to its anatomy or its form. Um, and you can you know, remind yourself of that uh, every time you take a breath. Um, and you'll see when you take a breath, um, as you're paying attention to what's changing within your chest cavity and how the air is flowing, is how closely um, the gas exchange functions of the lung are coupled and aligned to its underlying anatomy. And so our ultimate goal, um, you know, sort of career-wide goal, I guess, as a developmental uh, bioengineering group is to come up with techniques to build lungs outside of the body, ex vivo. And if we wanna build an organ that matches this functional anatomy that we have within our, within our lungs as humans, uh, we can break our task down into you know, two discrete design requirements. Uh, the first is that we need a hollow branched um, epithelial tree to conduct air, um, uh, which you can see moving in the GIF on this slide. Um, and then the second uh, design requirement is that we need a very thin, highly corrugated, so bumpy, um, gas exchange surface to allow oxygen to diffuse um, from one side onto the other. Uh, so we've been asking um, how these structures are built and are there clues um, to, um, uh, to how to engineer the, these, these two different uh, design requirements based on how uh, the embryo accomplishes these functions. Um, so, so to answer those questions, I wanna take a step back first uh, by considering the evolutionary tree, the tree of life, uh, which is shown here on this slide with the birth of the earth in the center let me see if I can get my laser pointer working. So the, the birth of the earth is here in the center and all of the extant species, so the species that are currently on our planet are shown on the perimeter of this um, diagram. And I, I wanna use this evolutionary tree to draw your attention to the fact that beyond this very smallest of length scales, all multicellular organisms other than plants have had to evolve gas exchange mechanisms to get oxygen from their ambient surroundings um, deep into their uh, tissues and cells from trachea and insects shown here on the top left uh, to gills and fish shown in the middle uh, to, to lungs um, in um, terrestrial vertebrates like birds and us. 
Um, and the diversity of these organs, these, these different gas exchangers, is reflected in their underlying anatomy, their form, um, and their physiology, their function. And so to appreciate that diversity, um, just sit back and think about the differences between how we oxygenate our blood um, as compared to the mechanisms used by birds, which are uh, now shown on the bottom of this GIF. So we have lungs of blind-ended tubes, right, which we ventilate by contracting our diaphragm, uh, which is this kidney bean-shaped teal structure in the GIF at the top. Um, that then leads to the generation of a pressure gradient um, that promotes airflow. And then gas exchange takes place at the terminal ends of the tree where oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream, right? So uh, we have both the, the tubes as well as that, that bumpy cul-de-sac um, uh, surface. Um, in contrast, bird lungs use bellows-like structures known as air sacs, which are, are labeled in the GIF and I'm pointing to with the pointer now. Um, and those air sacs are used to move air in a single direction from the trachea and then into the lungs and then back out. And so they never have to mix their oxygenated and deoxygenated air and therefore can achieve a much higher efficiency of gas exchange in their lungs. And so if we come back to our engineering design requirements of tubes for airflow um, and cul-de-sacs or bumpy surfaces for gas exchange, there's something really interesting uh, that happened over the course of evolution, over evolutionary time. Mammalian lungs, such as our own, um, and, and as well as those of mice, have both tubes and cul-de-sacs. Um, so both uh, 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 airways as well as alveoli. In contrast, bird lungs are entirely made up of tubes, uh, which are also used for gas exchange in the form of parabronchi. And lizard lungs, reptile lungs, are made entirely of cul-de-sacs. There's no tubes other than the primary bronchi that lead to the lung itself. And so we've been really curious about the origins and the engineering applications um, of this biodiversity and have taken the approach of investigating the developmental mechanisms that give rise to the lungs of mice, chicks, and lizards as models uh, for each of these different classes of vertebrates. Now, one way to approach this problem would be to identify the molecular pathways that drive lung morphogenesis across different species and then implement those pathways in tissues um, uh, outside of the body to engineer um, organ form. The first part of that, um, the identification of the signaling pathways is an approach that's been pioneered by luminaries in the lung development field with a specific focus on identifying the signaling pathways that are essential for building the airways and alveoli of the mouse lung especially given its use as a model for human lung development. And of course, dozens of molecules have been identified, some of which are shown on this slide, which is now terribly out of date. Um, but these exact same signaling pathways are used in the embryo um, to build lungs in all three classes of vertebrates, not just mice and humans, but also birds and, and reptiles. And so knowing this parts list, if you will, doesn't answer the question. It tells us what molecules are needed, but doesn't tell us anything about how we build those differences in, in tissue form and how we can take advantage of differences in tissue form um, as engineers. So since as bioengineers, we're most interested in understanding you know, how to actually build these tissues physically, we've decided to take an orthogonal approach and focus on the physics, the biophysics of the process. And so if we zoom out and um, you know, think of our simple epithelium as a material, like a balloon shown here, then that material will have some material properties. Um, it'll you know, either be more solid-like or elastic or more fluid-like viscous or somewhere in between a uh, viscoelastic. And because it's a material, it will respond to forces, either those generated internally or those imposed upon it externally. And, and in response to those forces, it'll fold itself um, into the more complex structures that we see within these vertebrate lungs, those tubes and um, bumpy cul-de-sacs. And so then if you zoom back in and imagine what it takes for that material, that straight tube or flat sheet of epithelial cells that lines the tree and the bumpy surface uh, to deform into a branch um, within the tree or into an alveolar cul-de-sac at the terminal end, there are three possible mechanisms um, or at least three possible mechanisms, right? The first is that the epithelium, that material could actively form sort of like a smart material. Uh, the second is that it could deform passively 
um, because it's being pushed from its apical surface. So the surface that would be facing the lumen of the airway where air would eventually be. And then the third um, possible mechanism is that the epithelium could be deformed passively because it's being pushed from its basal surface, uh, the surface that is in contact with its surrounding stroma or mesenchyme, um, so that the tissue outside of the airway uh, epithelia and alveolar epithelia of the lung. And so we've taken this viewpoint, this biophysical viewpoint, this material viewpoint, um, to try to uncover the forces that build lungs in the hopes of using some of mother nature's approaches as tissue engineers. And what I'm gonna to do today is to summarize work from three different species that are reflective of these three different classes of vertebrates. I'll first tell you about what we've understood from examining uh, lung development in chicks. And then I'll focus on what we've uncovered uh, examining lung development in mice. And then finally, I'll share with you what we've started to explore examining lung development in lizards. And what I hope to do along the way is share some of the basic principles that we think could serve us well uh, to engineer tissues using Mother Nature's approaches. So to begin, uh, the bird lung um, is, uh, is this beautiful, highly efficient um, gas exchanger um, called a parabronchial lung because of the, the gas exchange unit uh, is, is a tube. And it, it, it exhibits unidirectional or single directional airflow when it is mature and hence the, the high efficiency. Uh, but the initial structure of the lung um, before it has matured uh, is fairly simple. Uh, the lung begins as a wishbone shaped epithelial tube that's shown here in orange that ramifies or becomes more complex, generates more tubes uh, by generating lateral branches off of the dorsal surface. Um, so the surface back here in really highly stereotyped, highly predictable locations. And so uh, using uh, the chicken as a model system, we found that the epithelial cells, so those cells that line the balloons in my analogy and the airways um, in this model, um, uh, the epithelial cells which give rise to the branches do so by undergoing a change in cell shape known as an apical constriction uh, illustrated here, such that they shrink their apical surfaces um, shown over here, which are adjacent to the lumen where air will eventually flow. Uh, and expand their basal surfaces, which are adjacent to, um, to the mesenchyme. And this local change in shape of a very small subpopulation of cells is sufficient to bend the epithelial tube into a new branch. And so we can model this process computationally uh, by specifying patterns of apical constriction onto uh, thick walled cylinders that have the geometry and mechanical material properties of the um, uh, airway epithelium within the embryonic uh, chicken lung and by applying uh, the principle of finite volumetric growth. And this shows us that those very simple, very defined changes in cell shape are indeed sufficient physically uh, to generate a new branch. And so for the lungs of birds, um, I'm summarizing a lot of data here in a very short number, very small number of slides. Um, for, for the lungs of birds, um, so including chicken, um, like I just showed you, as well as related species like uh, quails and ducks, we found that the epithelium actively folds itself, sort of like a smart material, into new branches. And right now we're really excited to begin to actuate this mechanism by manipulating patterns of apical constriction in epithelial sheets and epithelial tubes um, in a tissue engineered setting. So bird lungs are unique uh, in that uh, the lungs themselves only contain tubes. And to understand whether the tubes of the mammalian lung, um, like the bronchi within our lungs, are also built using this active contractile mechanism, uh, we explored uh, development in the mouse lung as a model system. In the mouse, uh, the lung also begins as a simple epithelial tube, um, the trachea, which splits into two primary bronchi that then recursively branch to build the approximately 8 million tubes that are present within the adult um, organ, um, only a handful of which are shown um, in this movie that is spinning on the right. 
And at the same time as that epithelium is forming those 8 million branches, uh, the surrounding mesenchyme is differentiating into a number of different cell types, the most prominent of which is the airway smooth muscle, which wraps uh, circumferentially around the epithelium and is indicated in this, um, this schematic in red. And using transgenic mice uh, that express red fluorescent protein or RFP downstream of the alpha smooth muscle actin a gene promoter to, in, to label all of the differentiating smooth muscle cells, we found that airway smooth muscle first appears at the basal surface of the epithelium at future branch sites before the epithelium undergoes a change in shape. And so on the left, we have a bright field image of one branch forming in an embryonic mouse lung. In the middle, we have the RFP, the red fluorescent protein signal, which labels all of the smooth muscle. You can see it wrapped circumferentially around the parent branch down here and up the neck of this, um, this bud. And then it appears at um, the future branch site before the epithelium actually folds into the bifurcated geometry. And this pattern of differentiation sets up a pattern of differential stiffness surrounding that expanding or growing epithelium. And our data suggests that, that this pattern of stiffer cells from a softer mesenchyme is sufficient to shape the growing epithelium into new branches. So all of our data suggests that these patterns of smooth muscle differentiation actually serve as a mechanical constraint, if you will, kind of like a girdle to shape the epithelium as it's growing into the new branches that are needed to expand or ramify that tree-like geometry of the lung. And this means, of course, that instead of having 8 million patterned events of active folding by the epithelium, instead we have 8 million patterned events of passive folding of the epithelium that are driven by 8 million <laughs> patterned events of smooth muscle differentiation. And so uh, what we've been doing for the last few years is trying to understand how that is controlled, both the differentiation process as well as the patterning of the differentiation process as a new tool to stick into our tissue engineering toolbox. So to get at that problem, we first have to answer what specifies the pattern of smooth muscle differentiation. And to answer that first question, we have to answer a second question, which is, what are the cells within the mesenchyme that become, that differentiate into airway smooth muscle? And surprisingly, um, this is still... Um, rather controversial in some ways, um, in part because previously published lineage tracing studies were somewhat contradictory uh, with, with each other. And so because of that, we decided to take an unbiased approach uh, to identify the cells that differentiate into airway smooth muscle so that we could then understand what are the signals that are telling them to accomplish this differentiation and have, have a, a new um, uh, 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 a toggle, if you will, uh, to promote that differentiation process. Uh, so Katie Goodwin, uh, shown down here on the bottom left, a current graduate student in the lab, isolated individual cells, single cells from lungs at a stage when airway smooth muscle is actively differentiating, um, and then carried out single cell RNA sequencing analysis on the entire uh, lung population. And um, when she evaluated the data that she um, acquired, uh, she found that her data set included all of the expected populations of cells uh, within the lung, including the epithelium, um, shown here in blue, uh, the smooth muscle, shown in purple, uh, the mesothelium, which is a single layer of cells that wraps on the outer surface of the lung, sort of like saran wrap, if you will, um, shown in green, uh, the vascular endothelium, uh, that makes up uh, the vasculature, of course, uh, shown in teal. And then somewhat surprisingly, two separate but closely related populations of uh, undifferentiated mesenchyme that were um, uh, cl that clustered quite closely or quite next to uh, the smooth muscle population. And since Katie was interested in identifying which cells within the mesenchyme were differentiating into smooth muscle to wrap around the epithelium and uh, force it into branches, she focused her analysis on these populations. She began by 
taking those three separate populations of cells, the two undifferentiated mesenchymal populations and the smooth muscle population, pulling them out of the data set and then reclustering them. And when she did that, she found that all three were closely related. So this sort of looks like just a scattershot pattern. Uh, they're so closely related, in fact, that she was unable from this analysis to identify a transcriptionally distinct progenitor population. It appeared that every cell within uh, within the mesenchyme had the capacity to differentiate into smooth muscle based on this analysis. So given that they were so transcriptionally similar, these two different mesenchymal clusters and sort of um, uh, coral and yellow colors um, on, on this uh, UMAP plot, Katie then asked what distinguishes uh, these two different clusters. She wondered whether they were located in different positions within the developing lung or whether they had different functions. And um, to, to, um, you know, to explore these possibilities, Katie began by staining for markers that were preferentially enriched in each of the two separate mesenchymal clusters. So these are the undifferentiated mesenchymal clusters that were closely um, clustering with, with our smooth muscle population. And so I'm showing you some of that analysis, a tiny subset of that, that analysis here. Um, so for instance, uh, Katie found that the transcription factor LEF1 was expressed at much higher levels in one of the populations than in the other one. And when she stained for LEF1 in embryonic mouse lungs, uh, which is shown in the top row here in green, she found that it was expressed in mesenchymal cells, shown over here in the white image on the right, um, that were located adjacent to the epithelium. The epithelium uh, is located in this dark space in the top right image. And I hope you can appreciate that there's a single layer of cells in the nuclear stain in the image on the top left. And so uh, left one was expressed in this one cluster at higher levels than in the other cluster. The cells that are present within this cluster are located in the mesenchyme immediately adjacent to the epithelium. This is a location that's known as the sub-epithelial mesenchyme within the lung. Um, and um, is quite distinct from the location of the other cluster. And so uh, the other cluster, Katie found, um, expressed FOXP1, another transcription factor, at much higher levels than the previous cluster, which I hope you can appreciate um, from uh, the violin plots, uh, violin plot on the bottom left. And uh, when she um, stained for FOXP1 in sections of embryonic mouse lungs, uh, she found that it is expressed in the mesothelium, which is this single layer of cells uh, on the surface of the lung, as well as in the mesenchyme immediately adjacent to the mesothelium um, on this um, uh, medial surface of the lung. And this location of mesenchymal cells immediately adjacent to the mesothelium is known as the submesothelial mesenchyme. So we have uh, completely different spatial locations for these two populations of cells. To uncover which of these two different populations, the subepithelial or the submesothelial mesenchyme differentiated into airway smooth muscle, which wraps around the airways, Katie tracked the cells using a time-lapse imaging analysis after she had labeled them uh, using a, a confetti reporter. And she found that the subepithelial mesenchyme uh, actually differentiates into airway smooth muscle. And then using a marker analysis, uh, Katie's data suggested that the submesothelial mesenchyme, this other population, might actually preferentially give rise to vascular smooth muscle, which wraps around the blood vessels that are forming in the developing lung. Okay, so uh, using this bioinformatics analysis, Katie identified which population of cells is giving rise to airway smooth muscle, really the, the workhorse for forming the new airways within the developing lung, uh, which answered this second question. Uh, so then she next used bioinformatics to begin to answer the first question, what specifies the pattern of smooth muscle? Um, and we would like to understand this question or answer this question to the extent that we can then actuate uh, different patterns of smooth muscle differentiation outside of the body as a control mechanism, as a, a biophysical mechanism to fold epithelial tissues. So briefly, since this study um, was just published uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Katie performed a pseudo time analysis on the subepithelial uh, mesenchyme and smooth muscle populations. 
She then mapped out changes in gene expression over developmental pseudotime and identified transcription factor binding motifs that were overrepresented in the promoters and enhancers of the genes that were activated um, over pseudotime, and then uh, validated signaling pathways uh, based on that analysis. And if you're interested, there's a ton of data uh, within the study uh, that distinguishes which signals are activating early versus late stages of smooth muscle differentiation. All of the data are now um, posted on BioArchive and in the iScience uh, website. So all of our data collectively suggest that the mouse airway epithelium folds. It's a passive growing tissue, but it folds passively uh, in response to stiffening of the local mesenchyme in a specific pattern as that mesenchyme differentiates into airway smooth muscle, which is really distinct from the mechanism that builds airways uh, in the bird. And based on the bioinformatics analysis that I just alluded to, we're now working to devise approaches to control the spatial pattern of smooth muscle differentiation adjacent to epithelia to promote uh, specific and user-defined patterns of epithelial tissue folding. All right, so I wanna finish um, using the, the last um, uh, half of my time uh, by telling you about our recent work uh, focused on investigating the physical forces that drive morphogenesis of a new model system for us, uh, the reptile lung, uh, which is essentially a hollow bag with no branching, uh, but that has a very bumpy uh, epithelial surface of uh, favioli, uh, which are their equivalent of alveoli, uh, to promote gas exchange. And one of the reasons why we were really interested in investigating morphogenesis of this structure is because basically the entire lung is gas exchange surface and it forms itself really, really quickly. And so if as tissue engineers, we would like to generate alveoli or um, tissues that can promote gas exchange expediently, so in a, in a short period of time, then it behooves us to take advantage of the mechanisms that are used um, by organisms that develop their own gas exchange surfaces very quickly. So when I say very quickly, I mean this, this surface forms over, um, as you'll see, a period of about uh, two days, uh, which is in contrast to the gas exchange surfaces that develop in mammalian lungs, uh, such as those of mice or people. Um, mouse alveoli take weeks uh, to develop and human alveoli take years to develop. So very, very uh, uh, acute um, uh, differences in, in time scale here. So I hope you can appreciate the fact that this lung is simply uh, a large gas exchange surface uh, by looking at this Z-stack um, of a confocal stand, scan through an adult lizard lung uh, in which the epithelium is labeled in green. And so as the movie scans through the confocal stack, you'll see green bumpy, 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 and then um, a really black empty space shown now here. Uh, where uh, air is present. So there's nothing in there but air and then this really bumpy surface for gas exchange. So the lung itself is basically this hollow bag uh, that's lined with a bumpy corrugated, actually honeycomb shaped epithelial surface that promotes gas exchange um, with a structure that is somewhat similar to the alveoli uh, in mammals. And so we set out to ask how does that honeycomb shape um, gas exchange surface form. Uh, and uh, we decided to use the lizard as our model reptile. Um, and uh, the work that I'm about to show you was carried out by a really talented team uh, led by a recently graduated PhD student, uh, Michael Palmer. Michael began by choosing a model system. He chose the brown and null lizard uh, shown here as his model uh, reptile. He chose uh, the brown and null because it has a very short uh, incubation time of about uh, 28 days uh, from fertilization to hatching. Uh, they breed quite um, uh, vigorously in the laboratory setting and they're fairly small. So the lizards themselves are about the length of a pencil. Um, the eggs that they lay that contain the embryo are about the size of, of a tic-tac, so uh, a few millimeters um, in length. So Michael began once he had established, so chosen and established um, his, his model system, he began by mapping the development of that corrugated bumpy um, honeycomb shaped wall. Um, and uh, some of that development is shown here. So he found that the epithelium, uh, which is stained here for cytokeratins um, and is shown in white, 
begins as a smooth surface at embryonic day five. So this is five days um, after, uh, after uh, laying. Um, the trachea is up here, and then there's a left lung and a right lung. That smooth epithelial surface then inflates one day later. So this is one of the two lungs shown at embryonic day six. And then a day after that, at embryonic day seven, that smooth epithelial surface has dramatically formed these corrugations um, in that very short window of time. At the same time as that epithelium becomes bumpy, Michael found that it is surrounded by a second layer of tissue, the smooth muscle, which begins as a homogeneous covering at embryonic day six. So this inflation stage now is shown here on the left. But then that smooth, um, that homogeneous smooth muscle surface uh, gradually forms into hexagonal meshwork over the subsequent 24 hours. And then the epithelium forms corrugations or bumps um, through the holes in the smooth muscle layer, layer. So I hope you can appreciate that the green stained uh, epithelium in this uh, third row here is emerging through the gaps within the smooth muscle mesh uh, in the, uh, this image on the right. So how does this gas exchange surface form? Well, we go from a, a an essentially uniform covering of smooth muscle. And then a day later, we have a hexagonal meshwork and epithelial cells or an epithelial tissue um, protruding through the holes in the mesh. Uh, Michael spent um, uh, quite some time with the team in investigating the mechanisms by which uh, these changes in morphology occur over this very, very short window of time, short window for, for a vertebrate anyway. And he uncovered two really new exciting mechanisms um, that we can put into our tissue engineering toolbox. First, uh, Michael found that uh, the smooth muscle cells actually migrate to form this mesh, and they migrate in response to uh, changes in the direction of gradients of forces in response to pressure from the fluid within the, uh, within the lumen of the lung. And so um, this is a really cool possible strategy uh, to engineer um, you know, shapes of contractile um, uh, tubes of, of muscle. The second um, uh, new mechanism that Michael uncovered is that the pressure of the fluid within the lumen of the lung is what pushes the epithelial sheet through the holes in the smooth muscle mesh. And so we have a very physical mechanism by which this epithelium changes its morphology during developmental time. So we call this process um, that we've uncovered uh, stress ball morphogenesis since mechanical forces are serving to deform that epithelial sheet into that corrugated, bumpy, uh, favular uh, surface that is necessary for gas exchange. And this process itself is really similar to what happens when you increase the pressure inside of a stress ball toy when you squeeze it. Um, so we spent, then spent some time uh, trying to understand uh, what these new findings mean for possible tissue engineering strategies. Um, specifically, can we use these principles to engineer epithelial sheets that have you know, some topology to them that, that, are, that are bumpy, uh, if you will? And you know, to test this concept, we began by building a purely physical model of our lizard lung, which, consisted, um, which consists of a thin layer of silicone uh, that we drop cast onto, onto fluid and, to, and onto which we uh, 3D printed a meshwork of synthetic laponite clay. So just like a clay mask that you might put on, on your face, uh, when laponite clay contracts, or excuse me, when laponite clay dries, it contracts uh, and thus imposes a force on the underlying sheet. And we found that the contraction of that clay mesh was sufficient to uh, to deform the underlying sheet into corrugation. So I hope you can appreciate uh, shown here on the bottom that over time, the clay has contracted. It's labeled uh, fluorescently here on the bottom. And then in this uh, middle row here, we have an image of the, um, of the silicone film. And I hope you can appreciate that it has, uh, has deformed its morphology in response to contraction of the clay. 
the height of the, the bumps within the silicone film are color coded here. And so yes, indeed, contraction of a mesh can promote uh, corrugations in a physical model. We next asked whether a mesh of muscle cells um, would be able to exert enough force to deform a sheet into corrugation. So it's one thing for clay to dry, it's another for us to engineer a system with cells to accomplish these changes in shape. And to answer this question, we created a hybrid model, a bio slash synthetic model that consisted of a silicone film, again, drop cast onto an aqueous layer um, to mimic our epithelial sheet and on which we 3D printed a mesh of muscle cells that could be induced to contract with light. Um, and so here we were inspired by a work now published six years ago from Kip Parker's group uh, in which they used optogenetics or light to induce calcium influx uh, into muscle cells and thereby control the timing of contractions of those muscle cells. So we created a line of C2, C12 myoblasts, um, which are shown here on the bottom, in which we could stimulate calcium influx optogenetically, so with light, and then monitor intracellular calcium levels using a fluorescent reporter. And so how the system works is we uh, took advantage of a light activated um, calcium channel inducer um, called OptoStim1. In the presence of blue light, uh, OptoStim1 leads to the opening of these calcium channels on the surface of the cells, which promotes uh, the increase in concentration of intracellular calcium, uh, which then takes advantage of the um, muscle cells intrinsic contractile machinery and induces contraction. So on the bottom here, we have our um, C2, C12 myoblasts that are expressing our optogenetic construct, as well as a fluorescent calcium reporter. And when the light turns on, which is indicated by the white bar up here at the top, you should see an increase in fluorescence, indicating an increase in intracellular calcium. And uh, if you pay close attention, the strobing that you see is both um, a function of uh, intracellular calcium, as well as contractions um, of these uh, C2, C12 myoblasts. So now we have cells that we can induce to contract um, uh, in a user-defined fashion by exposing them to light. So we took these cells and um, 3D printed them onto the surface of our silicone films and then exposed uh, the, the tissues um, to, to light. And uh, what we found is that inducing calcium influx using this system is sufficient to induce contraction of the cells. And so on the top row here, we have a cell-free system as one of the controls. Um, on the bottom, we have our um, optogenetically um, activated cells. Um, and uh, after light exposure, we see that the cells themselves have led to uh, contraction of the 3D printed meshwork. And um, that is sufficient to promote corrugations of the underlying surface, similar to the gas exchange surface within the lizard lung. And so this movie shows that um, smooth muscle mesh now color coded in white um, and the underlying film is color coded such that um, the red areas are projecting out of the plane more than the blue areas. And I, I, what I hope you can appreciate is that contraction of these um, light induced cells is sufficient to fold the underlying surface similar to what we see within, uh, within the developing lizard lung. Um, so yes, contraction of a muscle mesh is sufficient to promote um, epithelial corrugations. And so what we found then is in the reptile, specifically in the simple lizard, the epithelium is a passive surface that is sculpted by forces uh, from the lumen of the developing organ um, via the, the, the pressure uh, that is present within the system and um, is, is um, you know, sort of tuned by uh, the, uh, the rigidity of the smooth muscle meshwork that itself forms in response to um, signals from the forces from the pressure within the lumen. Um, and um, that development is, is actually quite distinct uh, from the physical mechanisms that are used to build the bird or the mammalian lung. 
And what our studies investigating lung development in these three different classes of vertebrates have revealed is that there are at least three different physical ways by which the lung epithelium is, can be um, deformed into branches or cul-de-sacs. Apical constriction, physical forces from the lumen, and physical forces um, from um, uh, differences in stiffness from differentiation within the mesenchyme. And all of these um, uh, findings reveal that evolution itself has generated a really, really rich toolbox uh, for folding simple epithelial tubes into much more complex uh, tissue structures, uh, which gives us choices in the mechanisms that uh, we explore to build tissues outside of the body. So we're really excited to uh, continue defining the physical forces and the underlying signaling pathways uh, that control um, morphogenesis across different species. Um, we've recently started examining uh, morphogenesis within uh, the lungs of the developing veiled chameleon, which is a really interesting model system in that, in that its lungs take an exceptionally long time to form themselves. And so we're hopeful that by exploring its development, we'll start to understand a bit more, not just about physical forces, but also about how to time those forces in a meaningful way to control both morphogenesis as well as differentiation. And as engineers, we're especially keen uh, to actuate these diverse mechanisms uh, to begin to engineer and continue to engineer branched tissues outside of the body. Um, so all of the work that I shared with you is completed by a really fantastic team of students and fellows who I highlighted along the way uh, in collaboration with um, a couple of um, really awesome um, colleagues here at Princeton, uh, namely Andre Kojmarl in mechanical and aerospace engineering and Jared Tocher in molecular biology uh, with generous support uh, from our funding agencies. And so uh, with that, thank you uh, so much for your attention and I'd really be happy to take any questions. Thank you for this great presentation, Dr. Nelson. Several questions came in. Um, so one of them is, what is your opinion about what we do in 3D bioprinting process to design the final shape of an organ without passing embryonic development? Do we miss something in this bypass process? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a question that I've really struggled with myself. Um, um, because I think, uh, in terms of product, it makes sense, uh, you know, to to build the final morphology that you desire. That makes sense, except that there's probably some memory um, and within the cells that are comprising these tissues. Uh, in the sense that there's, they have some memory of the differentiation process, their, their, their embryonic process. And, and that's been observed in a number of different systems, right? Where, um, you know, the, the sequential stages that are necessary to, um, uh, to build these structures in the embryo endow them with some, um, you know, changes within their genome that uh, make them act differently than if you force differentiation or you force a morphology. And so my hope is that you wouldn't necessarily need to go through the you know, complex mechanisms that the embryo uses to build, um, to build its organs, especially um, the, the way the human body um, carries out those processes because they're so slow, um, especially if you wanna build something at the scale of an adult. Um, but, but I do wonder, as the question is suggesting, uh, whether um, by skipping some of these processes, we might inadvertently be losing, you know, some of the richness that is, is, is present um, or that is endowed upon the cells uh, because they have um, developed normally. Thank you. Uh, is there an evolutionary reason for the three different lung structures? Mammalian seems to be in the middle using a mixture of both mechanisms. Uh, yes, this is another one of those questions that we've been really trying to understand. Um, honestly, we were, we were stunned to find that there were very different mechanisms used to build <laughs> these lungs. Um, uh, conservation is sort of one of those uh, you know, key principles of 
developmental biology and the fact that we're finding, um, you know, different classes of vertebrates don't use conserved mechanisms is, um, you know, goes completely against the dogma. Um, evolutionarily, it's unclear, um, you know, why, why things end up the way that they do. Um, there are some hypotheses about how, uh, you know, when you know, different lineages along the evolutionary tree are, are formed, uh, you know, there's selection that takes place, not just for the fitness of the final morphology of the organ and the, uh, within the organism, but also the fitness to the environment at the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, across evolutionary time, the environment in which uh, these organisms were involving is, was very different uh, from what we're experiencing on the planet right now. And so it's entirely probable, possible as well as probable that um, some of the mechanisms that are now used you know, to build the, the highly efficient lungs of birds, for instance, were selected um, because um, uh, of the differences in oxygen levels, uh, for instance, that were present at that time. Um, to get at that question though, we've, we've started a collaboration um, to look at um, some of the uh, uh, genomic differences, uh, differences within the genomes um, of these three different species, uh, specifically with respect to uh, patterns of differentiation of the different cell types and how they are implemented over a developmental time. Um, so I mentioned that, um, you know, the, the signaling pathways are conserved, uh, which is quite interesting, uh, but they're employed in different ways uh, to, to build these different structures. And so we can't look at gene expression per se to get an answer to the question that you're asking, but we can look at differences in, say, the, the non-coding uh, DNA, the, the enhancer regions, to try to understand what might control differences in timing with respect to smooth muscle differentiation, for instance, or control differences in the um, morphology of the epithelium or its um, ability to actuate or, or um, activate apical constriction. So we're hoping that by uh, taking these sorts of approaches, we might get a little bit closer to the answer of, of, of this question. But unfortunately, although it's you know the question that everyone wants to know the answer to, there's you know, sort of an implicit untestable hypothesis uh, with, with respect to, um, to differences that we see across evolutionary time. Thank you so much. Another question came in. Thank you for the fantastic talk. Are you going to consider to look uh, at the endocytic pathway in your system since it contributes into cellular outcome and tissue formation? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm trying to understand the, the foundation of the question. I guess things go into the cells. Or... Yeah. Yeah. One of the, so, so related to, to that, that question is, is um, one of the big questions we have is about how cells within the epithelium might be communicating with each other during development and endocytosis might be one way in which this is accomplished. So they share, you know, these cells, which I use, I use the analogy of a balloon um, since we care about the, you know, the biophysics and the, and the, the material nature of the process. These cells share a lumen and so in principle, they could communicate with each other through the fluid within the lumen. We know the fluid itself Im impinges a, you know, a mechanical force on the developing tissue um, directly on the epithelium, as well as um, you know, transmitted from the fluid through the epithelium to the surrounding mesenchyme. But um, you know, the chem chemical composition of that fluid could also serve as a way to communicate um, across long distance, large distances within this developing organ. And so, you know, we have some hypotheses with respect to that. One way in which, you know, if there were, a, you know, more biochemically mediated communication occurring, uh, one way in which it could uh, take place would be through, um, you know, endocytosis per se, um, uh, in addition to um, binding to, to cell service receptors. But it's an interesting question. We have not yet explored uh, in any depth. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another one is, is there any data set, data set of ligand receptors in proliferation and differentiation? 
Absolutely. Yes. So uh, lung is one of those organs that has been intensely, intensively and intensely uh, investigated at the single cell level um, in many different species, um, mouse, human, and now uh, my group has data sets for, um, for chick and, and, our, and our lizards. Um, and so we, we have a rich understanding of both the receptors that are expressed in all of the different cell types of the developing lungs, as well as the, um, the ligands that are expressed in those same cells, as well as in the adjacent tissues. And so some of the, the prevailing um, hypotheses with respect to how to control, say, for instance, the formation of a branch um, is um, by changing the spatial positioning of expression of growth factors, for instance, uh, that could then signal to the adjacent epithelium through their receptors. One reason why we've chosen to focus on the biophysics of the problem rather than on, um, on uh, say, paracrine signaling through growth factor and receptor interactions is uh, uh, exactly because all of these same, all of these species express the same uh, receptors and the same um, uh, growth factors. And so it becomes really challenging uh, from that backdrop to understand, um, you know, how you, you use that information alone, so receptor ligand uh, expression, um, to, um, to build something as complex as the mammalian lung, and then to build something equally complex, but very different um, as, uh, as in the chicken lung. So it's sort of like having, you know, the the list of ingredients to build a cake, um, right? Without um, without the steps um, written out, uh, it, it's really unclear how you turn flour, water, sugar, eggs, uh, and a, a rising agent into a cake, and how, how you can use those exact same different ingredients to to make to make a cookie, right? Um, and so we've focused more on, on the steps rather than than the signals, but there are certainly really, really rich data sets um, looking at the, the different receptors and, and ligands. Thank you so much. Uh, one other question is, how can we do engineering on muscle fiber to template epithelium morphogenesis? Can you, can you repeat the first part of the question? Um, can we do engineering on muscle fiber to template epithelia, epithelium morphogenesis? We think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, so this is what we were hoping to, to show or to demonstrate with, um, you know, with some of the, the data that I showed at the end. Um, so we can certainly, I guess, maybe I, I spoke a little bit too quickly, but the, the 3D printed um, myoblasts that we were using to fold the underlying silicone uh, sheet, um, those had formed into myotubes uh, prior to um, uh, the stimulate stimulation with light and, 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 and the underlying folding. So, you know, sort of the first step in generating a more complex, uh, muscle fiber. So we think the answer is yes. Um, and right now, some of the challenges associated with that are really understanding the connections between the two different tissue layers and how transmission of force from contraction of muscle would affect the, um, the, the epithelial sheet itself. One thing I didn't have time to show was, was that um, in all of the movies that we've acquired from, or in many of the movies that we've acquired from, uh, from the, the reptile lungs, one thing that we can see is that the smooth muscle mesh uh, that is surrounding that uh, underlying epithelium, which is sort of like a water balloon in many, in many ways, um, the, the smooth muscle is sort of floating on top of it. So it's sort of, you know, it's really different from our classical view of, of, uh, of muscle adjacent to, to an epithelium. There seems to be uh, some, some give to the system, uh, which makes sense um, uh, if, if you, you know, think about how reptiles breathe, which I didn't get into, but one way that they deflate their lung is by contraction of that, of that smooth muscle mesh. And so uh, to prevent damage to the epithelium, you would want, you know, a little bit of, of ability of the, of the muscle to slide on top of the epithelial sheet. And so uh, one challenge that we have to, um, you know, face right now, um, overcome right now, one question we have to answer is, is how you generate a system where you have a floating muscle layer 
um, on top of, of an epithelium uh, such that when the former contracts, it can change the shape of the latter. But we think the answer, ultimate answer to the question that you asked is yes. Thank you. One final question. Uh, during the evolution of, you know, the lizards are historic animals. Um, one question, one part of the question is, uh, do you, uh, you know, the human brains, if you look at the Homo sapiens up to now, the human brains tend to get bigger. Um, are there any information about what happened to the lizard lungs from prehistoric times to today? And maybe can we even predict the future? Was it getting smaller, bigger, more efficient, etc.? <laughs> I love this question. Thank you for this question. <laughs> That's so such a cool idea. I can't say anything about size. I, I, I don't know about size. I think size has a lot to do both with how highly evolved the system is, but also, as I was mentioning, the environment in which the, the animals are, are evolving. And I think with, with, with climate change and the changing temperature um, in the globe, it becomes challenging to predict based on the past what's um, what's going to happen in the future with respect to size of the organism as well as, as the lungs. But what I can say is that um, the, the, the lizard lung I showed you is the simplest um, of the, as far as we know, of reptile lungs. Um, reptiles have, you know, really highly heterogeneous, highly varied um, sizes, um, as well as um, uh, uh, complexity in their lungs themselves. So, you know, they, they don't tend to have tubes or, of airways like we do as mammals, but they can exhibit features of, of um, highly efficient lungs like unidirectional airflow, even in the absence of, um, you know, series of tubes. And so Colleen Farmer, for instance, at the University of Utah has done some really beautiful work examining um, flow, airflow within adult lungs of, um, or I guess the lungs of adults of um, crocodilians. So alligators, crocodiles, monitor lizards, you know, these are animals that you definitely can't establish an animal colony in, <laughs> in a university setting. Um, but she's found by tracking the flow of air that they do exhibit unidirectional flow of air um, that is, you know, really driven by the morphology of the lung rather than by a series of tubes. So there's a complexity there, a beautiful complexity, sort of a, a fluid mechanics complexity uh, that is absent um, in, the, in the more simple lungs um, of, of some of the smaller lizards, perhaps because they don't need highly efficient gas exchange uh, to accomplish their, like their, their daily tasks. They mostly sit around and and bask in the sun and then chase after a cricket or run away from a predator. They don't really have high, uh, they don't have lifestyles that, that have high metabolic needs. Well, um, we have a lot of positive comments from the social media. Thank you so much. Great talk. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Mehmet. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day.